Oh boy, there's another one of these. Well, I guess I know what I'm playing on my channel now, so, uh, here we go. Yes, this is Scarlet enough for you guys, am I right? I mean, red version, Scarlet version, there's only, what, a 30-year gap between them? I'm Ephraim225, and welcome to my playthrough of the original generation of Pokémon. Or should I say, welcome to my four playthroughs of the original generation of Pokémon. Yes, this must sound completely crazy, but I've had the idea to do something like this for quite a while now, and uh, only recently when Scarlet Version came out and we all saw what it was like, did I finally find the motivation in me to do this. So let me explain what I'm aiming to do here. I'm going to play through all four games, and in each game I'm going to use a different playstyle throughout each playthrough, or at least try to. Um, I'm doing this because I believe Pokemon games can be played in a wide variety of different ways, and while I definitely believe this can be an entertaining thing for you guys to watch, this is also a bit of a personal journey for me, too. See, I'm sure that if I were to talk about my story of growing up with Pokemon, it wouldn't be that much different from everyone else's story of growing up with Pokemon. Uh, played the games when I was a kid, had the cards, watched the show, yada yada yada, but I think as the series has gone on and on and on, and I've gotten older, and a lot of people have gotten older since playing the first generation, I think we've forgotten exactly why these games connected with us so well as kids. I mean, like this first generation of Pokémon, um, there's obviously a lot of glitches present, and it's not exactly the most perfectly built game, it's got a lot of flaws that get corrected later on in the series. But I think that causes some people to look back at the first generation, wonder why it was so hyped, wonder why this was so popular, or why it was so beloved, or how it got the huge competitive scene that it has now. So, this playthrough that I'm doing, this weird idea of playing through the games four times, and then trying to do something different in each playthrough, I think by doing that I will rediscover some of the magic, and I hope you guys will too. So, uh, here we are. You can see that I've actually made a bit of a modification to this red version. I've got a female protagonist because two of the versions that I'm playing, I have modified them slightly for reasons that I will get into. For red version, it is literally just giving me a female protagonist. Although, because there are no text changes, the character still refers to you as a boy. So, uh, nothing I can do about that, unfortunately. Ah, uh, yes. All boys leave home someday, it said so on TV, so naturally I should send you out when you're only 10, or was it 11, to go on a journey across the land and capture a bunch of highly dangerous magical creatures, yada yada yada, you've heard all of these jokes. So of course the TV has Stand By Me playing on it for some reason, that's a bit of an interesting reference, I guess they really like that movie over in Japan. So yeah, um, I think at this point everyone's played through these games so many times that they actually don't bother talking to anybody because, well, maybe you already know what they're saying. Everybody knows what this guy is going to say, of course. But uh, everyone knows that you have to actually leave the town in order to progress the story, which is kind of weird. I don't think anyone would actually try leaving the town until they've exhausted all of their options, but that's what you have to do. Actually, this scene coming up uh, it kind of raises a lot of questions. Uh, how does the professor know that you're trying to leave the town? Uh, very interesting, but he seems to know where you are at all times, because if you try to use a key item when you're not supposed to, for some reason he starts talking to you, no matter where you are. It's really weird. There was so much that was weird in Generation 1. <laughs> ah, but now it's finally time to choose the starter Pokémon. And I don't think it will come as a surprise that each playthrough is going to get a different starter Pokémon, because this does actually change quite a lot about the playthrough, or at least the early parts are affected the most. But the later parts can be affected too, so we'll hopefully see that happening. And not only is each playthrough going to get a different starter, each playthrough is also going to get a different character. Let me show you what that means by introducing you to our first protagonist. This is Red. Red is going to actually do what the professor tells us to do at the start of the game, which is to catch them all. Red will start with Charmander and hopefully collect all of the Pokémon by the end of this playthrough. Now we're going to have to jump through a couple hoops because picking Charmander at the start will make things a little difficult. 
Now, as for our second protagonist, Blue, Blue is after only one thing. He wants to be the very best like no one ever was. So he's going to pick the best starter. The water starter is always the best in just about every Pokemon game, except for maybe X and Y, but uh, that's a long ways off. So Blue is going to pick Squirtle, which is undoubtedly the easiest starter to play with in the entire game. And our third protagonist is going to be, uh, Green. Well, uh, this screen looks a little different through Green's eyes. I think he might have been huffing something weird because he's actually going to pick the Grass Starter. Now, uh, this is a bit of a hot take, but you would have to be on drugs to pick the Grass Starter in any Pokemon game. Maybe that's why things look uh, a little bit different to Green, but I'm sure he'll uh, pull through and do something really special. Ah yes, and we can't forget about the fourth protagonist, Yellow. Uh, things went a little bit differently for Yellow. Professor Oak actually found a Pikachu right there in the grass and randomly threw a Pokeball at it and luckily was able to catch it. Well, that was actually pretty lucky of him. It didn't need to weaken the Pikachu or anything. And then later on, somebody decided to steal Yellow's starter. Wow, the rival was a jerk back then, stealing your starter, doing all sorts of weird stuff throughout the game. But that means we are left with the Pikachu as the starter. Not the easiest starter to work with either, but I'm sure Yellow will find a way to manage that somehow. So, after picking our starter, we have the first battle of the game already. The rival character uh, really wants to show us who picked the better starter, so he's going to challenge us straight away. And you don't have to win this fight. In fact, it's pretty RNG whether or not you win this fight. But it gets you to level 6 immediately, as soon as the game has started. So that's actually really helpful. It gets you a little bit of a boost early on in the game. Now, uh, you only have normal type attacks this early in the game, so type advantages don't come into play yet. And this tends to be RNG because you are basically hoping that the computer picks the move that reduces stats instead of actually doing damage. Not that reducing stats is a bad thing. In fact, the reason Charmander probably has a tough time here is because Squirtle can actually lower your defense with Tail Whip, and that's not good. That means it takes less hits for him to beat you before you beat him. You can lower his attack, but I don't think that's as effective as lowering defense. Fortunately, Red was able to come out of this fight without even using the first potion you get at the start of the game. It was a little tougher for Blue because Bulbasaur is actually more defensive than the other two starters are, and in fact, Blue had to actually use the potion that was in the computer for some reason. I don't know why that potion was there or how they expect you to actually know that you can pick it up, but it really helps you win this initial fight, because your opponent isn't going to have a potion and you will. So there's that. And as for Green, well, well, he seems to be doing as well as Red, although he did barely pull ahead of his opponent just in time to win. What's up with the sprites, though? Wow. Anyways, if you can believe it, Yellow actually has the roughest time with this initial fight because your opponent is now an Eevee who has Tail Whip and Tackle, and Pikachu's defense is so low that if this Eevee Tail Whips you, you are not going to survive two Tackle hits, unfortunately. But, with luck, you can pull ahead and get to level 6, and Pikachu even learns Tail Whip himself, which is not that helpful because Tail Whip lowers physical defense, and Thundershock, the move Pikachu starts with, is a special move. Yeah, that's actually going to be a recurring theme in this video, I think. A lot of Pokémon just have moves that do nothing due to the difference between physical and special attacks. Also, this Pikachu actually follows Yellow around on the map, because the Yellow version is actually based on the TV show, that ran at the time, but everyone knew that already. So, with that out of the way, we can finally begin the journey, head north, and leave the starting town. And uh, while we are heading on to the next town, I would like to talk a little about the changes I made to this blue version, because I did not talk about them yet. So, the obvious change is that I am now playing as the rival character, and the player character is now the rival in this version, and interestingly, uh, the guy who made this patch actually changed the rival character's dialogue so that he just has ellipses like Red does at the end of Gold, Silver, and Crystal. The other patch that I put on is that, so uh, many of you may know that there are four versions of Generation 1. In Japan, they had initially Red and Green 
and then they had a blue version that redid all of the sprites and uh, redid some of the programming to fix some bugs and everything was just a lot nicer in this third version of the game. So internationally, the red and blue international versions are based on this third blue version, but they use the game data of the original red and green versions. And that causes a couple of issues later on down the line, but um, for this blue version, I wanted to play with the changes that were made in that third version of the game, the game data changes. So some of the trades will be different, some of the encounter data will be different, but those are the only two changes that I made to this version that I am playing. Also, here's a secret potion that you all probably knew about. There are secret items like this throughout the game, and I'll be picking them all up. So, they do something really weird here. Uh, they make you trek all the way to the second city, get a parcel for Professor Oak, and then bring it back to him, and then he gives you the main objective of the game? Really weird. You could have done this a lot sooner, but I guess they wanted the players to get acquainted with how the game is going to work. So, now we have the scene where Professor Oak gives you the Pokedex and tells you to go and catch them all, like it says on the game's tagline. Uh, however, I would wager a very small percentage of the player base actually did that even at the time, because you actually need to interact with the other versions of the game to get all the Pokémon. And this is so weird because the game treats it like it's the main objective of the game, but that actually isn't true. The actual objective is to go around to the different cities and collect all the badges and stuff. Everybody knew that, but I'm just pointing out how weird it is that they treat catching them all like it's the main objective, when in reality, it's really just an optional side thing. You don't have to do it, but actually in Generation 1, there are reasons to actually go out and collect Pokémon, so um, that'll be something that rewards Red in the end, I guess. So anyways, another weird thing that they do in Generation 1 is that they put an optional rival fight off to the left of Viridian City if you go towards the Pokémon League just after getting the Pokédex, but before having the first badge. Now, what's even weirder is there is a special event that triggers if you beat this fight. Well, you don't have to beat it, you could lose to it too. But if you beat this fight without having a badge and without having any Pokeballs or any additional Pokemon caught, uh, there's a special event that triggers back at Professor Oak's place. So I have to solo this fight, and depending on what starter you pick, uh, this changes the difficulty drastically. So first up we have a Pidgey, and Pidgey is exceedingly annoying because it has Sand Attack, which lowers accuracy, so if it hits you too many times with Sand Attack, you'll be rolling dice a lot in order to actually fight this out. And as you see, I leveled up Charmander, he has his Ember move, which actually does quite a lot of damage because it matches his type, so it actually gets a bonus to damage for that, and it can inflict Burn randomly, which will lower physical attack and also drain health every turn. Now, unfortunately, I got very unlucky and um, missed a couple embers, so the Pidgey was able to get three sand attacks on me, which means I have to face Squirtle with lowered accuracy, and um, Squirtle at level 8 learns its elemental move, which means he can do super effective damage to me because water beats fire, of course. And this makes the Charmander version of the fight one of the harder ones because, like, if you try and solo this anyways, uh, you have to face Squirtle while it's got a move that can deal super effective damage to you. The other starters get their elemental moves at level 9 for Charmander and level 13 for Bulbasaur, which makes Bulbasaur the worst starter in my opinion, because you have to grind out so much just to get him a decent move. At level 7, Bulbasaur gets Leech Seed, which drains health every turn, and that can be annoying too, especially if you've had your uh, accuracy lowered by Sand Attack again and again because every time you miss, he's gaining even more health from you. So, Blue, uh, even though Squirtle is the superior starter, Blue had to use a lot of potions, so it's a good thing he picked up that hidden potion, because that saved him in this fight. And I swear, I had the worst RNG while I was recording, because I missed so many tackles, and Bulbasaur got so many critical hits. But even Blue eventually pulled through in the end with one health, if you can believe it. That must have been an epic fight that I just shortened. It was literally just us trading tackles, so it wasn't that interesting. Now, in Yellow's case, this is actually interesting. Yellow version replaces the Pidgey with a Spearow, which is a lot easier for Pikachu to handle. 
uh, Spiro's moves do less damage to Pikachu, you'll be able to do more damage to him. But then Eevee comes out, Eevee has picked up Sand Attack, so he's got Sand Attack, he's got Tail Whip. This would normally be a very dangerous situation because any of those moves could ruin you. Pikachu's defense is still very low. Um, if I had leveled up Pikachu one more time and gotten him to level 8, I would have gotten Thunder Wave, which would have helped out a little bit. It causes the Paralysis status, which makes it so that the enemy has a 50% chance to just outright lose their turn. But as you can see, for some reason the computer just kept going for Tail Whip over and over and over again. Like, all seven turns that I needed it to use something other than Sand Attack or Tackle, and it used Tail Whip every time. So that was just a little bit embarrassing, but as the rival says, I did in fact luck out. So as for Green, um... Green seems to have an interesting move, and interesting HP while we're at it. Um, what the heck is Skill Machine 14? Um, Green? You doing okay over there? Uh, Green? Ah! It feels like I've woken up from some kind of fever dream. Um, but it looks like Red has beaten this fight as well, so uh, now we can actually move on with the game. So I mentioned that you need to beat or lose to this fight in order to trigger an event back at Professor Oak's lab. It's really weird. Um, you need to not have any badges or any Pokemon caught as well, which is really strange because this is the event that gives you five free Pokeballs. And, you know, this is so weird, because normally, in the other games in the series, you get these free Pokeballs right away after getting the Pokedex, but here you have to do a bunch of other stuff, and there's a text glitch as well, so that's interesting. Um, I guess they completely forgot about this event and didn't correct any of the weird stuff about it. Anyways, uh, interestingly, a video of that event is on my channel from, like, all the way back in the early 2000s, it's still the most viewed video on my channel, and I have no idea how to feel about that. So yeah, I think we should get to the actual capturing now, don't you think? Uh, to capture Pokémon, you have to lower them down to a little bit of health and then throw a Pokéball at them. You don't want to accidentally KO them like that. That Rattata was unfortunately too weak to survive a hit from Charmander, so it got KO'd. For some reason, you cannot capture Pokémon that are KO'd and lying there fainted on the ground, all vulnerable and ready to be taken by you. But no, you have to go through this weird process of lowering them to just a little bit of health, so they're just barely conscious and then you can capture them? It's never really made that much sense to me. You know, it kind of makes me wonder if the Pokémon are maybe not actually fainted and are suffering from something even worse, like, I don't know, death, but then this is a kid's game, right? A kid's game with capturing animals and forcing them to fight each other for glory. Uh, yeah, everyone's made this joke already, let's move on. You know, to be honest, I do wonder if there even is any joke you can make about Pokémon that hasn't already been heard. But, I suppose I should just stick to the gameplay. Um, on the first route of most Pokémon games, there are two common encounters. A pigeon of some kind, or sometimes a dove or some kind of other bird, and a rat or rodent of some kind. So, Pidgey is the first generation bird Pokémon that you find on the early route. The early bird, you might say. Yeah, that was a pretty obvious joke too. Um, I'll try and think of something else. So, those are the only two Pokémon on this route, and they're not exactly that useful. So, something that's unfortunate about most of the Pokémon that you find in the routes and stuff. Also, I've moved on to that route to the left of Viridian City, and I found a Nidoran. I'm catching these guys at such low levels that it's really difficult to imagine actually using these guys, because... In this generation, grinding from such a low level is really, really hard. At least until you get to the later areas and they start throwing out some stronger enemies to give you more EXP. But EXP in this early area is really difficult to come by. So we saw a Spearow earlier. This Pokémon is actually a little bit easier to level. Leveling from 5 is a lot easier, and it's got an actual elemental attack. See, the thing is... Uh, the Peck move is actually counted as a Flying-type move, and the Gust move that Pidgey has is not counted as a Flying move, so uh, Pidgey's Gust can't be effective against things that Flying moves would normally be effective against. It's really weird, so I think I will see some use with Spearow later on. 
And it also took a lot of encounters to get this. This is a female Nidoran. Nidoran is the only Pokemon in Generation 1 where they actually have two separate species for the male and female versions. Nowadays, most Pokemon have a small difference in their body depending on whether they are male or female or not, such as the shape of Pikachu's tail. And hey, speaking of Pikachu, uh, Yellow actually came into this route because there is an encounter that they added in the Yellow version. This is Mankey, it is a fighting type Pokemon, and Yellow is going to need this later. So they added it here because they knew Yellow was going to need something like this, and it also helps that Ash, the main character of the TV show, also had a Mankey at some point. Well, he had a Primeape, which is the evolution of Mankey, so kind of the same thing, kind of not. But uh, yeah, for Yellow version, I'm actually going to use Pokémon that Ash used in the TV show, or at least those evolution lines. So that'll be something interesting, I'll try to adhere to that as much as possible. But yeah. We captured that using Thunder Wave to inflict the status effect. What the heck is a pig monkey? Okay, that's a little, that's a bit of an odd term for it. Oh yeah, and Pikachu has different reactions depending on things you do in the game. It's really nice. Anyways, with that out of the way, we can move on to the first real dungeon of the game. It is the Viridian Forest, and it's full of bugs. I mean, this game is full of bugs, but I'm talking about literal bugs here. You know, bug-type Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that joke is overdone? I don't know. So for some reason there's an invisible item above this guy's head, it's an antidote. A really weird place to put it in, a very common item to make invisible. But you do need antidotes in here because you can find bugs that will inflict poison status on you, which would not be good because I think the burn status does not hurt you in the overworld, but the poison status will hurt you in the overworld. With every four steps you take, I think, the poison Pokémon will lose one HP, which is not good because they can faint on the overworld. And yes, I'm aware that I accidentally KO'd that Weedle, by the way. Uh, pick the wrong move to use on it. As mentioned before, Gust is not a flying type move, even though kicking up wind is something Pidgey does, and Peck is a flying type move because I think you're pecking at something that's beneath you. You're higher up on the pecking order. I don't know if that joke actually works, but I caught a Weedle, so that's interesting. Bit of an unlucky number, that's number 13 in the Pokedex. So, I was having some real trouble with this area, I kept trying to find the encounters that I wanted to get, and I think I ran into like 20, 30 encounters before I just gave up and started actually fighting trainers. So, bug catchers are what are in this forest, and bug catchers are interesting because um, if you really know your Pokémon history, you know that this game actually started out as a bug catching game, because um, in Japan, bug catching is one of those traditional children's activities but you can't do that as much because there's so many buildings nowadays. So the idea when they created Pokemon was to create a bug catching game and that eventually evolved, funnily enough, into a game about capturing all kinds of creatures and making them fight each other. But yeah, I, I believe that the first dungeon being full of bug catchers is kind of an homage to that original idea, but I could be wrong. Anyways, they're not that hard to defeat. Bugs really aren't the strongest Pokemon in the game at this level. Uh, speaking of bugs, I actually found the other bug type that I wanted to catch. It is a Caterpie, and it's obviously a Caterpillar. Uh, these these bug Pokémon actually evolve very quickly. They evolve at levels 7 and 10, which is a little bit strange because some of the trainers around here, they have like level 9 or 10 Weedles and Caterpies that for some reason haven't evolved even though they've hit the correct level. Also, fun fact. Uh, in the Red and Blue International versions, if you follow this path through the forest, you get no encounters due to a bug, funnily enough, in the tiles that are supposed to generate encounters. Due to a change they made in the International version, those tiles no longer generate encounters. How nice, you can avoid fighting if you would like. Anyways, there's just one more trainer on the way out. He has one of those overleveled bug Pokémon that I mentioned. He's gonna have a level 9 Weedle. I guess they just evolve their Pokémon whenever they are ready to evolve, I guess. They just... something like that, anyways. Uh, anyways, um, it's very easy for Red to get through this forest because she has a Flying-type and a Fire-type Pokémon. Those are both effective against bugs, but Blue is going to do just fine. He has his Bubble Attack on Squirtle, so he can get through this pretty easily. I mean, it's not that big a deal that you don't have a type advantage on these guys. They still go down pretty quickly. 
and they're trying to use String Shot, which is a move that reduces speed, but it keeps failing. For some reason, moves that lower statuses, they have a chance of failing for some reason. I don't think it's an outright miss, but I will have to look up the specifics of that to clarify it. Anyways, he mentioned that you can sometimes find stuff on the ground. Well, um, actually, if you check the tile in front of him, you find an extra potion. I think I found the item he dropped, but it's kind of mine now. <laughs> And Red got really lucky on the way out of the forest, she found a Pikachu! Yes, you can catch Pikachu in this forest, but only in the red, blue, and green versions. Yellow version, you start out with a Pikachu, so you don't really need to catch another one. So, uh, there you go. I don't think you can catch another one in yellow at all. But what happens if you trade another Pikachu... Oh, actually, I know what happens if you trade another Pikachu onto your yellow version. It just doesn't count as the walking Pikachu, the one that follows you around. So yeah, now that we're out of the forest, we can move on to the next city. It is the first city to have a Pokemon Gym, which is where you can battle to prove your worth and earn a Gym Badge, which is a symbol of your status as um, somebody who can beat a trainer who uses only one type of Pokemon exclusively, I guess. I don't know. I joke about the low difficulty of this gym quite often, but for a first-timer who doesn't know what they're doing, this can actually be very, very difficult. But not for Blue. Uh, Blue picked Squirtle at the start of the game, so he has a Pokémon that can just run over this entire gym. This entire gym and its grand total of two trainers uh, use Pokémon that are weak to Water-type moves, which Squirtle has at this point, so uh, very easy for him. Uh, for some reason, this first trainer has two ground types, and the leader, Brock, has two rock and ground types. Which is a little strange, I don't know why the first trainer isn't using rock types. Maybe because Generation 1 just didn't have enough rock types for them to uh, fill up this entire gym with them, but uh, I digress. As mentioned already, Bulbasaur can get Vine Whip at level 13, so you have to grind for it a bit, but you can get a move that works on this gym. Uh, Vine Whip is a grass move, and it beats rocks as well, so that's something you can do. But Charmander, and especially Pikachu, have it much, much rougher. Um, in red, blue, and green versions, I looked at all of the encounters you can find up to this point. None of the catchable Pokémon have a reasonably easy-to-acquire move that can beat rock types. None of them, I'm telling you. So, barring the starter, your options here are actually very limited. Of course, it's also true that none of the opponents here have any elemental moves of their own, so they're stuck with just normal-type moves for doing direct damage themselves. So if you didn't pick Squirtle, then more likely than not, you're just going to have to outlast these guys. Which is not that easy, because they do have some decently strong physical attacks. I forgot to mention that Brock himself has Rock and Ground-type Pokémon. They're both Rock and Ground at the same time, and both of these types are weak to Water and Grass, so if you have either of those types, uh, you're actually doing four times the normal amount of damage to this guy, but the first trainer, uh, he just had ground types, so you'd be doing less damage to him. He might actually be stronger than Brock, which is really amusing to think about. So Brock leads with a Geodude, whose strategy is to increase his physical defense as much as possible. Bubble, Ember, and Vine Whip are all special attacks, so this completely ignores any defensive buffing he does. If you raise Caterpie, you can eventually evolve it into Butterfree, who learns Confusion, which is also a special attack, but I think that takes a lot of levels, so I wasn't interested in doing it. Meanwhile, Onyx here tries to lower your physical defense while also having a move that does more damage depending on how much damage you do to him. Uh, Blue is just going to defeat Onyx before that ever becomes an issue. As for Red, Red just has to use Charmander and use Ember a lot and hope for maybe a burn status or something else to happen, like a critical hit. Uh, Ember at least gets through the physical defense of these Pokémon, and both Geodude and Onix will eventually go down, but this is still a strategy that requires you to maybe use a couple of potions in order to stay alive. Come to think of it, you can't even find any special attacks besides Butterfree, like I mentioned, on Pokémon that you capture. The good news is, Onix will sometimes use the move Bide, which makes him do nothing for three turns, and then at the end of those three turns, any damage you inflicted on him is dealt back to you at double the power. If he uses that, the best plan is to just avoid using any moves that deal direct damage. Maybe hit him with some stat-lowering moves or something. So, as for Green, he hasn't learned Vine Whip on Bulbasaur, so he has to do something else. Typically, that something else is going to be using Leech Seed, and then hoping you can outlast the enemy while the Leech Seed slowly drains away all of their health. Uh, a very slow and tedious process, and you might think that you could speed it up by using Poison or another status effect, 
Uh, unfortunately, unbeknownst to most players, Brock has 200 full heals, so anytime you poison him or something, he's just gonna heal it away, which is uh, rather unfortunate. What is Green doing here? He's got Rattata, and he's using Stun Spore, which inflicts paralysis. Wait a second, if the computer is forced to heal away the paralysis every time it's inflicted, you could completely lock him into doing absolutely nothing, because he's got 200 full heals and he's always going to use one. Alright, I'll give you that that's actually a very creative way to win this fight, but, uh... Wait, how did you even get Stun Spore on a Rattata anyways? What? what what Okay, I don't think I get it, but a win is still a win. Now, that just leaves the yellow version of this fight, which is a vastly different beast from the red, blue, and green fights. So, um, since you start with Pikachu, obviously you don't immediately have a move that can damage any of these guys. In fact, Pikachu can do absolutely nothing with Thundershock because ground types are immune to it. So, that necessitated catching a Mankey and learning Low Kick, which is a fighting type move that is not only super effective, it does more damage based on the weight of the enemy Pokémon, which is good because rocks are actually pretty heavy. So that's the reason Mankey is now on that route. You can catch him and learn Low Kick and have a move that can actually deal effective damage. In addition, the Nidorans were also given Double Kick, another fighting move way earlier than they would normally learn it in red, blue, and green versions, so there's that too. But you're not completely out of the woods yet. Geodude is the easy part of this fight. Uh, Yellow version made some modifications to the move lists of a lot of Pokémon, and for Onix in particular, they added something really, really nasty for the first gym battle in the game, I gotta say. So Onix still has Screech, which lowers defense, he's still got Tackle, and I'm pretty sure he's got Bide as well, but he's also got Bind. Bind is a really awful move, it is one of four trapping moves, and in Generation 1, if you are hit with a trapping move, you cannot do anything while you are trapped. You are completely stuck. You can only switch to another Pokémon, and even then you still lose your turn. So as long as the enemy is faster than you and they have a trapping move, they can just keep using it over and over again. And unless they miss, then you are just completely stuck. You have to be faster than the enemy in order to get around the trapping move. It's really awful design choice. And don't you worry, all players have to deal with a trapping move at some point in their Pokémon careers, don't you worry. In the meanwhile, however, I basically have to hope that Onix picks a move other than Bind, because then I can actually do something against him. All of my Pokémon are slower than Onix for some reason, but that's probably because they're underleveled. Anyways, I need Onix to pick a move other than Bind, which he eventually does. He uses Bide again. Remember, this causes him to do nothing for three turns, and then any damage he took during those three turns is dealt back to you, doubly so. So, you want to avoid using any actual damage moves, and instead use moves that lower his stats. You can lower his accuracy with Pidgey's Sand Attack, and what I'm doing here is I'm using Caterpie's String Shot to lower his speed. This will make him slower than me, and uh, for those of you who don't know, the speed stat determines who goes first every turn. So by lowering his speed, that ensures that I can at least deal some damage before he can use Bind. And if he does use Bind, I can switch to another Pokémon and do something before he can use Bind again. It's actually pretty nuts that I actually had to pull out a strategy to use in the Brock battle of all things, but uh, I guess that's nice. Although, I did miss a lot of low kicks for some reason. Like, I know there's a bug in Generation 1 where every move has a chance to miss, even if its accuracy is supposed to be 100%, but I don't think that's happening. Also, low kick can also inflict flinch, which causes the enemy to just lose one turn. So that was nice to find out. I didn't know low kick could do that in Generation 1. Like, there's so few flinching moves in Generation 1. And the icing on the cake when I finally defeat Onix, everyone gets 69 EXP. Nice. <laughs> so Brock says, I took you for granted, but I guarantee you everyone read that as, I took you for granite. I mean, it's a rock pun. It's nice. Oh yeah, so we finally have our first gym badge. These have a variety of weird effects, but the main one is that they let you use certain moves outside of battle. We'll learn more about that later. And he also gives us a technical machine for Bide, which means one of our lucky or unlucky Pokémon can learn Bide. 
which is a pretty lame move, so I wouldn't use that at all. In fact, I would just sell that TM for money. But that is the first Pokemon Gym dealt with, and uh, there's seven more to go, and then we can take on some of the strongest trainers in the entire region. Pikachu's pretty excited about it now, and, uh, well, it looks like that'll conclude the first episode of this very strange adventure. Uh, if you liked what you see, leave a comment, and, uh, if you have a suggestion for how this video series could be improved going forward, please let me know. Uh, this is a very new idea for me, so I hope I'm not boring anybody, for example, by playing the same fight over and over again. And if you think I omitted something that I should have shown off, you could, uh, leave a comment with that, too. But until next time, I am Efring225, and this has been the first episode of my Pokemon playthrough, and uh, I will leave you with the infamous Jigglypuff song that is well known for putting everybody to sleep, which uh, seems to be happening with Pikachu right now. Uh, hey, uh, little buddy, wake up, we gotta get out of here. Uh, I suppose we'll have to continue this when he wakes up. Later, everybody.